how can we screen appropriately for both of these conditions? And then how can we also um, intervene in an evidence-based way, even in a brief setting like um, an outpatient medical follow-up? So has anyone heard this quote before? When you hear hoofbeats, look for horses, not zebras. Um, and if so, what, what is this getting at? Does anyone know? No, it's a dreary Monday, but some audience participation. Are you thinking about really what's more realistic? Exactly. Yes, Laura. So are we thinking about what's most realistic, right? It's sort of like Occam's razor. Often the simplest explanation tends to be um, one of the ones that's most likely. So when we're thinking about children and adolescents that we see in our clinical practice and in whatever setting you're in, um, here are the current diagnostic criteria. So for post-traumatic stress disorder, which is displayed here, these are the criteria for um, folks who are age six and up. Um, as you can see, it requires exposure to an actual or threatened death or violence. Um, and that exposure could be learning about actual or threatened death or violence, um, either you know, directly from a family member um, or learning about something through, for example, like the media or the internet. And we're looking for symptoms in these broad clusters. So the first cluster is intrusive symptoms, right? We, we're looking for at least one of these. It could be something like a nightmare, a flashback, really vivid um, memories that kind of just come, come up for the person unprompted. Um, avoidance symptoms. So one or more um, ways that folks are either internally or externally avoiding trauma reminders. So external could be things like if I got into a really bad car accident, I don't drive down the street where that happened anymore, or I don't get in cars anymore. Internal avoidance could be something like whenever I think about the car accident or I talk about the car accident, I get really distressed. So I do my best to avoid ever talking about it. And I really try to push down any thoughts or memories that come up about it. We might also look for um, some mood alteration symptoms or negative cognitions. So things like being more irritable, um, being really hypervigilant or on edge, having um, sleep disturbance, um, uh, negative cognitions about self or others or the world, right? I'm sorry, there's a typo there. Two or more symptoms of hyperarousal, so that would be the irritability, hypervigilance, disturbance. And these all need to be present for at least one month and result in clinically significant distress or impairment. Um, we may also see folks with more of a delayed um, expression, so symptoms don't begin um, for maybe, there's about six months after the trauma and then symptoms that. start, <laughs> and dissociation may also occur, right? Where someone sort of might appear to, to zone out or space out, um, or kind of have out of body experience. Thank you, thank you for calling that lady. I'm now, just for kids and... under six years, um, the symptoms are actually going to look just a little bit different. Um, and what what we'll expect to see is fewer kind of uh, symptoms for them to meet threshold. So when we're looking at intrusive symptoms, if they're under six, they don't necessarily need to be described as distressing because children that age might not have the language to describe them like that. And the content of any trauma-related nightmares might not be clear. So a child that young might not be able to recall specific content of a nightmare they've had. It might not appear to be directly trauma-related, um, but it could still be scary and distressing. When we're looking at those avoidance or mood alteration symptoms, um, the, we've removed the criteria of, extra, oh, I'm sorry, of internal avoidance because, once again, children at that age have a much harder time describing that and we may not be aware that they are experiencing internal avoidance. Um, we, we do note that there is an increased frequency of negative emotional states in children at this age, um, and it may be things like decreased expression of positive emotions. They may be acting more socially withdrawn or showing less interest or participation in things they previously enjoyed. Um, and then for those hyperarousal symptoms, um, we've just kind of from the DSM removed um, the requirement 
requirement of reckless or self-destructive behavior, um, as we don't often see that in children at that age. We could still see that irritability. We may still see that kind of jumpiness or being on edge, that hyper arousal. Um, and so things like that may still be present in, in young children. Now, in schizophrenia, we have just these criteria, uh, and they aren't differentiated by age. But what we know is that we need at least two or more of the following symptoms from this A category here, and they need to persist for at least one month. And of those symptoms, at least one of them needs to be one of these bolded items. So the person needs to be experiencing either hallucinations, delusions, or disorganized speech. Um, and hallucinations can take many forms. One of the most common um, that you may hear is um, voices or noises that um, you know the patient can hear that other people cannot. Um, but hallucinations could also be seeing things that other people can't see, um, smelling or tasting things that other people can't smell or taste, or feeling like physical sensations that um, others can't feel, right? It, things that are in the absence of external stimuli. Um, delusions would be very fixed, rigid patterns of thinking that don't have a basis in reality. So we may be thinking about things like paranoia, grandiosity, um, you know, hyper-religiosity. We can see things like that. Um, or disorganized speech. And that could just be extreme tangentiality, playing associations, all different kinds of ways that speech can be disorganized. Um, but for the person to meet criteria for schizophrenia, we would need to see at least one of the symptoms be one of those three and last for at least one month. Um, there needs to be clinically significant impairment in that person's functioning um, across multiple domains. And we need to see these signs persisting for at least six months. During those six months, um, it is okay if some of the symptoms that they're experiencing are only what we would consider uh, negative symptoms or um, disorganized behavior during what might be more of a prodromal or residual phase. And these are not caused by any other substance, um, medication, or medical or psychiatric condition is kind of the rule out for schizophrenia. So why are we differentiating? Well, first, you may hear people talking about things like positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Uh, and just to clarify what these are before we move on, um, positive symptoms are those things like hallucinations or delusions. It's an excess of what we might consider normative experiences. Um, so they're not necessarily positive in the terms of pleasant, but positive as in there's an excess, right? There's a, a positive finding that this is present. Negative symptoms are what we might consider the absence of normative experiences. And so those are those things like reduction in emotional expression, flattened affect, um, poor social activation, uh, reductions in speech and motivation, things of that nature. And actually, it's the negative symptoms in schizophrenia that tend to cause the most disease burden. Um, they tend to be the less, res less responsive to treatment, and they tend to cause the most distress and impairment for um, our patients. So the reason I want us thinking about what are the diagnostic criteria is because there are also important things when we're thinking about assigning a diagnosis of either PTSD or schizophrenia in children and adolescents, and that is normative development. So in, in your opinion, what would be some aspects of normative development that we should consider before jumping straight to a diagnosis of, for example, childhood onset schizophrenia? Imaginary friends. Imaginary friends, excellent. What else? Imaginary friends is definitely, oh, I'm sorry? I was gonna say along that line, like sort of the, four-year-old's like little magical world of thinking. So it may seem like they're uh, hallucinating or, um, uh, you know, having delusions or something because they're thinking things that are magical and normal for their creative minds at that age. 
Exactly. So we would want to take into consideration brain development, right? Like imaginative play. Um, is the child able to engage in perspective taking? Um, you know, do they have imaginary friends? Are they describing things that are more like imagination and play based? Um, or is it something that is, is more concerning than that? Excellent. And so when we're thinking about, um, I'm just going to keep an eye on the time here, um, other diet disorders to rule out prior to assigning a diagnosis of childhood onset schizophrenia, um, some things that we might want to consider as rule outs would be things like autism spectrum disorder, right? We know that there's some really concrete or rigid thinking that can be present in autism spectrum disorder that can sometimes look a little bit like psychosis. Um, PTSD, we would want to rule out. Um, a substance use uh, and order, disorder or another like um, medical condition. In small children, sometimes things like um, epilepsy or um, like night terrors and nightmares are also things that we would want to consider ruling out before assigning um, a diagnosis of childhood onset schizophrenia. And then my final discussion question for this portion is, Based on um, the diagnostic criteria that I showed you for PTSD and schizophrenia, what are some of the symptoms that they both share or that they seem to share um, symptoms from PTSD that might be um, interpreted as psychotic symptoms? Any ideas? Flashbacks. Flashbacks. Excellent. Yes, that's a big one. Flashbacks and other intrusive symptoms. Excellent. Avoidance, like loss of interest in things, right? Social withdrawal. This can all look a lot like um, those negative symptoms of schizophrenia we talked about. Sleep disturbance. Um, certainly flashbacks, if there's dissociation, right, or nightmares, these are things that can look like that. Excellent. So is it a horse or a zebra, right? And that's where we have to kind of put our thinking caps on as a medical professional. So what we know is that even in adults, the lifetime prevalence of schizophrenia is below 1% of the population. It's used somewhere around 0.3 to 0.7%. And the peak age that schizophrenia onsets is late teens to early 20s in people who are assigned male at birth and early to mid 20s for folks who are assigned female at birth. And any onset prior to this is even more rare than that 0.3 to 0.7%. Um, and it's so rare that there's not a great estimate of this in the literature. Um, but there are some indications that anywhere between kind of 0 0.1 to 0.3% um, um, in, in children and adolescents. And we also want to consider the impact, you know, of, of culture when we're thinking about interpreting things as potentially psychotic symptoms or not. For PTSD, on the other hand, the lifetime prevalence is much higher. It's about 8.7%. Um, and so just based on the numbers, you can already tell that the number of people that you're likely to interact with on a daily basis in your job who meet criteria for PTSD rather than schizophrenia, it's going to be much more likely. Um, historically, that number has been lower in younger children. But really in the research, it's considered that this is likely because we ha don't really have great um, developmentally informed diagnostic criteria are great screenings for this. Um, and when we are looking at um, common comorbidities in children, PTSD might get missed because we could be seeing things like ODD or separation anxiety that are kind of more predominant. And that's what, you know, the family is coming in um, expressing concerns about. But we do know that children are at higher risk for long-term behavioral and emotional damage through trauma exposure. And how does this happen? Well, there's kind of three possible relationships between trauma and psychosis, right? The first is experiencing trauma in childhood is a risk factor for developing psychosis later in life. And that is something that we know from the literature is a risk factor. 
Um, the other relationship is that experiencing psychotic symptoms can place someone at risk of experiencing trauma, for example, um, through um, hospitalization, right? That can be traumatic for some people um, or traumatic like rejection or neglect by, by peers or loved ones or family members. Um, and the third is that trauma and psychosis can influence each other, right? So someone who has experienced a trauma is at risk for developing psychotic symptoms down the line. When someone is actively psychotic, they might be more likely to um, be in situations that increase the likelihood of experiencing trauma. Um, you know, if they're using substances to cope, that could also put them at risk for experiencing physical or sexual abuse, um, neglect, various things like that. And so we want to be mindful that it's not always as clear cut as is it one or the other. Sometimes they can both exist. So what are some common factors that we know PTSD and psychosis can share? Um, this high arousal and hypervigilance that I talked about, um, so a very kind of like anxious, preoccupied presentation, um, sleep disturbance, avoidance of certain people, places, things, and those internal cues, um, emotional numbing, or that kind of like flatness, uh, selectively attending to certain material. Um, so that could be information that uh, for example, if you think someone is following you, you're really selectively attending to um, a car on your street that you keep seeing, and that could be because um, you your house was broken into, and so you have PTSD and you're worried about that happening again, or it could be related to a diagnosis like schizophrenia, right, where you're paranoid and your, your explanation of that is someone is monitoring you or surveilling you. Um, safety behaviors, so that could be constant checking of things like, have I locked the front door, right, and, and repeatedly checking um, whether or not the front door is locked, um, or am I engaging in things so that, um, you know, the voices won't harm me, things of that nature. Um, dysfunctional thought control strategies, like, uh, if I just do this, then things will be okay, right? If, if every time I uh, get in the car, I wear my seatbelt and I drive 10 miles under the speed limit. I'll never have another car accident um, as kind of an attempt to control that anxiety. Um, high expressed emotion can cause relapse. So the more worked up um, or the more stressed out or overwhelmed someone becomes, the more likely they are to experience more symptoms. Um, things like dissociation and then having intrusions. So thoughts, you know, sensory data and emotions that just kind of intrude on the person's daily experience, whether they're intending for that to happen or not. So PTSD and psychosis actually share, as you can see, quite a few um, common factors. And it makes sense that sometimes they get confused for each other, especially when we consider that really research estimates somewhere between 75 to 98 percent of people with disabling psychiatric conditions also experience multiple traumatic events. Um, that's a really high percentage. Um, and that says we really need to attend to the presence of trauma um, and, and really screen for trauma no matter who we're talking to. Um, and samples from the United States and the United Kingdom, exposure to two or more traumatic events did significantly predict the later development of psychosis. Um, and particularly, um, childhood sexual abuse has been related to the later development of auditory hallucinations um, in adults. Uh, and we also know that exposure to trauma can increase risk of like suicide um, or suicidal ideation, um, greater symptom severity, and decreased treatment effectiveness. Um, so when we're working with folks, and if we haven't screened for trauma, but we notice that, you know, we're prescribing an antidepressant and it's just not as effective as we'd like it to be. Um, or there are a lot of other things, you know, that are kind of out of this person's control that we're noticing. We may want to take a step back and screen for trauma, right? And think about, is this something that's potentially impacting my patient? And then um, we also thought about the role of systemic and or institutionalized oppression or trauma on the folks that we're working with. So if people are coming in to see us and, you know, we work in a doctor's office and they seem very guarded or very hesitant, um, we may not want to assume that that person is paranoid 
or experiencing persecutory delusion. It could be that there's a mistrust of the medical system. It could be that you know there's a mistrust of medical providers um, or of providers who look like me. And so we want to think about how might this be at play rather than just assuming that someone is experiencing paranoia. So what can we do? Um, when trauma and psychosis are both present, as medical providers, as I mentioned, it's really important that we know about that risk of suicidal ideation and suicide attempts, and that we're doing consistent screenings and following up on these screenings, that we're, you know, doing safety plans with our patients, or we're consulting with a behavioral health provider or someone like CPAN who can help us do some of those safety plans if needed, and that we're following up on them to see if they're working for patients. Um, we also know there's just more emotional ability and poor social functioning. So how can we support our patients through this, especially if we're thinking we're working with kids and adolescents, school and social interactions are so important to them and so important for their development. How can we help support healthy social functioning? Um, lower remission rates in treatment. So, you know, we might not expect to see full um, remission from these disorders, and yet we can still see symptom improvement. Um, folks might struggle more with treatment compliance, and there may be higher levels of substance abuse. So even when working with kids and teens, it's really important that we're screening for substance use or medication misuse um, as well. And we're not just kind of, you know, assuming that there's no way this could be part of the clinical picture. And that includes things like alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, all of that. Um, there might be a higher level of dissociative symptoms that we need to account for, um, more mood and anxiety symptoms present. Um, and so if that's the case, if someone's coming in with really predominant depression, anxiety, but really what's underlying that is the trauma, then just prescribing an SSRI is not going to be enough alone to kind of help improve uh, these symptoms, right? We would also want to think about a referral to outpatient therapy. So for you and your settings, and I don't know which setting um, everyone is in, which symptoms or presentations have you typically seen the most in your own practice up until this point? Have we seen any of these, these symptoms before, like dissociation, um, flashbacks? Avoidance, excellent, thank you, that's a big one. I had a patient who had a, a significant, I assumed um, she was adopted. So she had, I believe, a sexual abuse and had nightmares and stuff, but she actually developed um, the old pseudo seizures, which is now PNES mm -hmm. um, dissociations, especially at night, which I think they had said might have been when stuff was occurring. Yeah, excellent. So PNES, dissociation, nightmares. I see Dr. Brax also dissociation. Excellent. Anything else that we typically see the most in our practice? So given this information, how are we currently screening for trauma and or psychosis with our patients in our clinics? And are we doing this screening consistently? Um, I'm, I am not actually, um, I'm actually trying to form a practice with medication management for psych stuff because I really loved it. Um, but my question, actually, I have a question about the screening for trauma. And if they do have a history of trauma, how can you necessarily correlate that that's causing their current symptoms as opposed to just maybe a simple anxiety disorder or something because they have a positive history of that? How do we know or how do you know that the trauma is directly creating what they're having? That's an excellent question. And we can circle back around to it a little bit more because we're going to talk about screening here in a couple of slides. Um, but one way that we can do that is assessing did the symptoms that they're endorsing start 
after trauma exposure or did they predate trauma exposure? Because the, also the thing that we know is folks who have a pre-existing like disorder like depression or anxiety are at higher risk for developing trauma after being exposed to a traumatic event. Um, and so it is possible that they may have had anxiety, an anxiety disorder, then experienced trauma, and now it's worsened things and maybe even developed a comorbid PTSD. Or it's possible that, you know, if we if we ask, did you experience any of this prior, they wouldn't have met criteria um, for anything trauma happened or multiple traumas happened, and then the symptoms began. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Um, and then I see some folks are saying non-existent screening procedures in place. Um, and CPAN does have screening tools for trauma that can be provided to enrolled PCPs. So thank you for that information, Laura. Um, that's really important. And then we should also kind of be thinking in, in the clinics that you work in or with the patients that you work with, um, how could cultural factors impact our interpretation of these symptoms? And, are, you know, are there times that you can think of where um, a patient's cultural background has impacted the way that they've, you know, presented when they were talking to you um, in their appointment without disclosing, you know? de-identified information. If not, that's okay. I'll ask that folks kind of be pondering this right as we move forward. So what are some screening measures that we can use? And my note here is that screeners are not diagnostic. So even if you build into your clinic policies or procedures that, you know, everyone gets a trauma screen um, or even a, you know, brief screen for psychosis every time they come in, even if someone screens positively, that doesn't mean, oh, now we diagnosed PTSD. That means now we need to do a little bit more digging, right, or potentially um, refer for an evaluation. Some things that can give us a good start, though, for children are things like um, the Child PTSD Symptom Scale, the Child Stress Disorders Checklist, the Child Trauma Screening Questionnaire, and the PTSD in Preschool Age Children Measures. Um, again, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just a couple of ideas. Um, for adolescents, things like the UCLA PTSD Reaction Index, the Trauma Symptom Checklist, um, the Children's Psychiatric Rating Scale and the Brief Psychiatric Rating Scale are also things that can be used as screeners. Um, and then beyond that, we don't just have to do something that, you know, is on a handout that we hand to somebody. We can also ask screening questions each time we work with patients. And the, the thing that we want to be thoughtful of when we do this is um, asking about specific labeled behaviors. So sometimes we're taught to screen for trauma like, have you ever experienced, you know, physical or sexual abuse? And someone may answer no to that question. But if we ask a question that's specific and labeled, like, has anyone ever um, hit you, slapped you, or pulled your hair, someone may answer yes. And the reason for that is they may not have, you know, thought about that as, physical abuse in their mind, they may not label it that way, but if we ask a specific question about a behavior, um, we get a better idea of if someone has ever experienced that before, right? Has anyone ever touched you in a way that, you know, was unwanted or that you did not consent to? Um, or has anyone ever, you know, touched your genitals or whatever age-appropriate word that you want to use in a way that, you know, you had not given permission um, to do so? Um, we would also want to ask sometimes, you know, I think when we screen for psychosis, we ask, like, have you ever seen or heard things that other people couldn't see or hear? Um, and that can be really vague as well. So sometimes asking specifically things like, um, you know, have you ever heard voices, um, you know, saying your name or um, saying other things that other people said that they couldn't hear or that it seems like other people couldn't hear? Um, have you ever felt things um, that, you know, 
on your body that didn't make sense when you kind of stopped and thought about it. An example that I give is um, many of us wear like Fitbits or, or watches, right, that will vibrate. Um, and this is an example many of us can use. We thought that we felt our watch vibrate on our wrist. And then we looked down and realized we actually forgot to put it on that day. Um, and that's kind of an example of a sensory hallucination. So anything like that ever happen? Um, we would also want to then ask if someone answers in the affirmative, are these beliefs or experiences normal or abnormal in that child's cultural context? Um, so a big one, I think, in Texas is people d describe prayer, right, and their religious experiences talking to God or God spoke to me. And if that's normal for that person's religious background, their familial background, we're not going to say, oh, my gosh, this this kid is psychotic. Um, if it's abnormal, right, and it's like they're, the parents are concerned, there are some of these other behaviors going on, then we would want to screen further and refer for a more in-depth evaluation. So again, we can always screen. Screening in and of itself is not diagnostic. It just gives us more information about things we need to spend more time asking questions about and considering a referral um, to a mental health provider or specialist. Let's say we do that. So we screen, someone screens positive, we you know, refer them for an evaluation, and they come back and they have a diagnosis of either PTSD or childhood onset schizophrenia. What can we do in our clinics to manage this? Well, there are treatment options available. And I think the first thing is to let families and children and adolescents know that there is hope, right? Treatment does exist. Um, for trauma, we can use SSRIs in children. Um, but really the most evidence-based intervention that we have is something called trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy or TFCBT, which I have a little asterisk by on this slide. Um, so if you're working with children and families and the child has um, PTSD or just significant trauma symptoms, that's a great referral, right? To, to give them a referral to an outpatient therapist to provide TFCBT. Um, for children with a psychotic disorder, we would really want to refer to psychiatry and psychology for assessment and treatment. Because this is something that is um, so rare and something that can be more serious, um, we would really want behavioral health specialists in, at least involved in the treatment team and the care and management of this child and this family. Um, there are outpatient um, therapies that I have listed here, things like CBT, um, family-focused therapy, um, stress management, psychoeducation, things of that nature. Um, there is some evidence of um, antipsychotic use in um, children. Long-term studies aren't, don't really exist with fantastic data on that yet, but we may see things like um, risperidone um, and quetiapine and things like that prescribed um, for children. Um, for adolescents, when we're thinking about treating trauma, it's very similar. Um, SSRI is something that can be helpful medication-wise. TFCBT is really our gold standard outpatient psychotherapy. Um, but things like EMDR or CPT, cognitive processing therapy, may also be good fits for um, the adolescent and their family um, as an outpatient therapy option. In adolescent onset psychosis or schizophrenia, um, again, there are some studies on antipsychotics with this age group. Um, the ones that have been most studied, I've listed here on the slide. Um, they do have a pretty heavy side effect um, profile, though. And so, again, I uh, would recommend having a behavioral health specialist um, involved in the treatment team, if not kind of taking um, over primary care of the um, prescription medication side of things for this population. Um, interventions that exist include things like CBT for psychosis, again, family-focused therapy, things like supported education or employment. Um, when these symptoms start at this age, it's really important that we try to help kids and teens be successful in school um, and in work to um, help keep them healthier and functioning at that higher level. So things like case management um, and appropriate um, academic accommodations are things that we really want to work with families um, to achieve. Which is all well and good, 
but you in your clinics and in your roles, you may not be able to provide CBT for psychosis, right? Or you may not feel comfortable prescribing an antipsychotic. And that's all completely okay. Um, what are things that you can do in the moment, though? If a child or a teen um, comes into your office, they have this diagnosis, or they have significant symptomatology, and they're experiencing distress. Um, and that's something I want to spend a little bit of time on today. So I have a couple of brief skills that anyone can do that we're going to review in this handout, in this slide. Um, and then I also asked um, for these materials to be provided via email to you all. So if there's anything that would feel helpful to you to use um, in your own practice, you kind of have some resources and materials. The first kind of cross-cutting skill is something called rounding. And we can use this when kids or teens um, are dissociating, um, if they are distressed because of psychotic symptoms, um, or if they're distressed because of trauma-related symptoms like flashbacks um, or intrusions or that hypervigilance, right? Um, and it's really simple. It's the 54321 method. And so what we're going to do is ask folks to keep their eyes open throughout this whole time. Um, look around the space they're in and name five things they can see, four things they can feel or touch, three things they can hear, two things they can smell, and one thing they can taste. Um, sometimes the smell and the taste is a little hard to do in a, a medical um, setting. So if you're able to provide that person with a, a cup of cool water, or um, you know, if there's a mint or something like that that you have on hand, that can really help enhance um, the effectiveness of this skill. And you can go through this cycle as many times as is helpful for the patient. Maybe doing it once kind of helps bring them down. Maybe they need to go through this cycle three or four times with you. That's okay. Um, have them practicing naming something different in each of these sensory modalities during each cycle. So again, we would do this with our eyes open to keep us present in the moment. And we would want to engage all five of our senses to also help us be present in the moment. We can also do some deep breathing with folks um, who might be experiencing hallucinations um, or flashbacks or nightmares or just, you know, who are really anxious. Um, this is a base, basic abdominal breathing exercise for older kids and teens. Um, you can teach deep breathing very simply by just encouraging people to breathe um, down into their belly, pretending that they're blowing up a balloon, right? So on each slow inhale, they're going to push their tummy out like they're inflating a balloon. And on each slow exhale, they're going to push their tummy in like they're deflating a balloon. And I like to joke with folks, sometimes it's an ab exercise, right? We can kind of think of it as getting our ab exercise in while we're doing our deep breathing. Um, again, we can take a few minutes to do just a few slow deep breaths and help manage some of that anxiety um, that folks are having. And then this one is a skill called look, point, name. Um, this is just pure visual grounding. And it's something that you can really teach um, your, your child or your teen patient to do by themselves, to do with you, or to do with other you know, family members or friends. So sometimes I like to frame this as a game. Um, again, we keep our eyes open. We're going to look around. And we're going to take turns looking, pointing at, and naming as many things in the room as we can see. And we want to we want to do this until we just can't really name things anymore. So you could be with patients and they could be pointing at things like the electrical outlet. Um, they could be pointing at things like, you know, the doorknobs and um, the ceiling tiles and like that, that scratch on the wall over there, like whatever it is. But we want to get them to a place where they're kind of out of their heads a little bit. They're in the present moment and they're focusing on something that isn't the level of distress they're currently having. Um, you could do it by naming objects or by naming the number of colors that they can see. Um, in medical clinics, usually they're not very colorful places, so it's kind of easier to go with objects and saying things like trash bag, trash can liner, chair, stool, blah, 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 um, continuing to kind of go for as long as they can. So this is an object that you can really do. Um, and in our last few minutes here, because I do want to save time for what are some of the key takeaways from today? The first is, no matter the age group, screening for trauma exposure and symptoms and psychosis should be done routinely. 
and we can ask some of the questions that I have here. Things like, does your mind ever play tricks on you? Um, you know, do you hear voices or noises even when no one else is around? Uh, who takes care of you? Are there times when you take care of yourself, especially if the child is very young, right, to kind of get it neglect? What happens when you misbehave? Do your parents or guardians fight? If so, how do they fight? Um, and this can give us like very that specific labeled behavior and give us clear information about whether or not abuse or neglect may be happening. Remember that these screenings are not diagnostic as standalone tools. Um, they just give us more information to query about and to think about making a referral. Um, so if you're working with someone and they do screen positive for psychosis and or trauma, we wanna first consider, okay, what is developmentally and culturally normative for this person? Um, we then wanna make sure that we're definitely screening for suicidal and homicidal ideation and any self-harm behavior like cutting or burning or scratching. Um, these are things that we want to make sure we're also doing routinely, and especially if any of these other symptoms are present. We want to screen for substance use, right? Um, and that, as I said before, includes alcohol. It also includes medication misuse. So if they have prescription medications or a family member in the home has prescription medications, um, are they taking their prescriptions as they're supposed to? You know, do they ever take more? Do they ever take medication that isn't prescribed to them? Those are also really important questions to ask. Um, we would then want to refer to a qualified mental health professional um, for a more comprehensive evaluation. Again, this is something that CPAN can um, collaborate with um, and kind of help um, with that evaluation or help connect to a provider who's able to do that. And we would also want to do a complete comprehensive medical workup. So we would want to check on things like a thyroid, right? We might want to check on things like um, cortisol levels, or we might want to get an EEG or some things like that if there are other signs um, that there are conditions we want to rule out before assigning one of these diagnoses. And the thing that we always want to remember is we don't want to just wait and see and do that sort of watchful waiting approach for things to get worse. What we know is that early intervention is best. So, you know, even if you refer and they come back and they get that comprehensive evaluation and it's not PTSD or psychosis, you haven't done anything wrong. That's what we want to see. Right. We, we would rather more people get referred and get fully evaluated so that we can catch the folks who really need it because early intervention is the most helpful. Um, we want to do exactly what you're doing right now. Right. Continue coming to um, professional development topics um, on this. Um, seek consultation with providers and colleagues, um, including people who have expertise in multicultural presentations. Um, we also want to kind of consider our own self-reflection and self-management techniques. Sometimes providers feel really anxious asking about trauma, or if someone endorses that they hear voices, um, providers might start to feel really nervous or fearful as soon as they hear that. Um, and think, oh my gosh, this person is really ill. I can't help them. What am I going to do? And so really examining ourselves and our reactions to patients when we hear these things or when we're thinking about the need to screen for these symptoms um, and thinking about how we can manage our own responses so that we can stay effective with our patients, even if it's something that, you know, might not be our favorite topic to bring up or to discuss. We also don't want to just look for confirmatory evidence. We want to consider the whole picture. So if, if we're working with a child and they say they hear voices and the voice that they hear is the voice of, for example, their father telling them you're worthless, we don't want to just look for evidence that confirms, okay, this kid has childhood onset schizophrenia. We want to look up because they're hearing voices, right? We want to look for other information. And maybe part of that other information that we that we look for reveals that's something that their dad actually told them when he was abusing them. And so it's more of a flashback, right? The, this voice that they're hearing is more of a flashback than it is an auditory hallucination. So we want to be very thoughtful about not just looking for confirmatory evidence when we're working with kids, teens, and families. Um, and we want to approach every clinical interaction from a trauma-informed lens. Whether trauma is present or not, um, and whether we know about it or not, we can still approach every patient and family um, with respect, with as much transparency as we can provide, 
and respecting patient autonomy. So, you know, even in exams, doing things like, okay, now I'm going to, you know, um, give you this immunization. Is it okay if I touch you on your right arm now? Can you pull your sleeve up for you? And just being very um, transparent, telegraphing, you know, if we're going to touch a patient, um, if we're asking a question or if we need to do something, why we need to know that, um, kind of our rationale um, can help us be very trauma informed. And being as warm and as empathic as we can um, when patients are disclosing information to us as well, um, rather than just, you know, staring down at our keyboard and saying, uh huh, uh huh. Um, if they're talking about something difficult, we're making that eye contact, and we're helping them feel comfortable. Even things like that are trauma informed. Um, so just bringing as much of that into every patient interaction that we have as possible. Um, I also have some resources on this slide here um, that are really fantastic. The National Child Traumatic Stress Network has a list of um, evidence based therapies um, for children who have experienced traumas, as well as um, some community and local um, resources and connections. CPAN, as we've already noted, is a fantastic resource. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is also a fantastic resource. Um, they, you know, have a phone number and a text number that's free and available 24-7. Um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness is also free and has wonderful services for children, teens, and families. Um, and there is a Tyler chapter, and I've included their information here. There are a couple of phone apps. Again, this is not an exclusive list, but these are things that might be helpful with you and your patients. Um, and then I've included the link to two videos here of ways to do a quick screen and an interview um, for trauma with a child and with a parent. So if actually seeing an interview is something that would feel very helpful to you, um, these two videos on YouTube can be um, a, just a great resource for you to see how do you ask those specific labeled questions if you're working with a kid and how would you ask if you're working with a parent for my references and thank you for your time and attention i appreciate um, all of your participation today as well and i wanted to set aside time for questions so at this point in time are there any questions that i can answer for folks oh and my email is here as well if if you have questions come up um, you know, after the fact, please do feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to respond. Thank you, Dr. Ross Young, and excellent session as always. So if you would like to ask Dr. Ross Young a question, please do feel free to unmute yourself. Um, the one thing I appreciate about her is she likes to be able to engage with you as an audience, and um, I think it makes great learning for everybody. Um, Dr. Flynn, I've appreciated you um, sharing with us and I would encourage you to continue to do so. So I'll start the questioning because I do have a question. Yeah. You talked about the auditory hallucinations. Yes. My question for you is, as a provider, how does one determine the difference between an auditory hallucination and self-talk? I, I think question. about uh, kiddos that might hear something negative, and then even as they become an adult, they continue to hear that negative, and it keeps playing as a tape in their head. That's a great question. And I think, you know, a few things that we can ask um, just to get more information are, um, what does the voice sound like? You know, does it sound like you? Does it sound like someone you know? Does it sound like a stranger? Um, if it sounds if it's in their own voice, um, sometimes we then want to think, oh, is it mood congruent? Meaning, does it fit with, like, if they're coming in and they're depressed and they're hearing, you are worthless, you are worthless on kind of a loop, um, is that more indicative of their own self-talk, right? That they're just thinking, like, okay, they're hearing it in their own voice. It fits with the mood they're currently experiencing. Um, and they're really, like, dwelling and ruminating on this maybe it's not as much of an auditory hallucination. Um, if, again, this, it's, a, it's a bit um, specific, but if um, the voice is that of someone else or that of like a stranger, um, is it something that they've heard before? You know, is it a family member who's saying something to them and that actually 
um, is something the family member has said or would say. I worked with a, this was an adult patient, but he would hear his mother's voice saying very um, rude and, and mean and, you know, unloving things to him as an auditory hallucination. And when asked, he would say, oh no, she would never, she would never say this to me. That was very out of character for his mother, which was true. Um, and so it wasn't a, a trauma symptom for him. Um, there are other folks who will say, oh yes, you know, I hear, I hear this voice and it sounds exactly like my uncle. And that's what he said when he was abusing me. Then we might want to do a little bit more digging to see if that's more related to trauma or more related to an auditory hallucination experience. Um, so it, it kind of just comes down to like asking questions. Um, like I said, asking more about when it started, what sorts of things kind of trigger it. Um, is the voice happening constantly? What makes it worse or better? And getting that information can sometimes help us distinguish if it's more trauma related or mood related or something that's more of a hallucination. Thank and you. sometimes it's hard in kids because they have a hard time explaining to you what's happening internally. And that's okay too. Um, we just, we do the best we can. Great, thank you. What other questions do we have for Dr. Ross Young? Do you want to drop them in the chat or just shout them out? While we're waiting for those questions, I'm going to put the uh, QR code back up here for folks to see. That was that if any of the, the resource slide or the handouts would be helpful. Um, it looks like you've also dropped the email address in for folks to reach out to if they'd like a copy. Um, fantastic. Oh, thank you, Dr. Brax. I'm so glad you were able to come. Any other questions? I try to be really mindful to not talk too much. I think we have a quiet group today, Dr. Ross Young. We do. It's a very like dreary, um, you know, Monday. So I get it. I get it. Um, we have a question. Does psychosis present differently in males? Um, great question. Uh, sometimes it can. Um, you might see things like um, the age of onset tends to be younger. Uh, sometimes they tend to have like more negative symptoms and be diagnosed a little bit later. So prognosis isn't as great. Um, in some males, we also see a higher incidence of comorbid substance use and comorbid irritability. Um, so you can see a little bit more like suicidality, homicidality in, in our male patients. Um, but as far as like the quality of his psychotic symptoms, not as much. I would say one exception would be tactile hallucinations, um, which outside of, if not substance induced, like for example, methamphetamines, um, female patients tend to experience more and actually female patients with a history of sexual abuse tend to experience them a little bit more. So um, other than that, not as much. Great question. Awesome. Yeah. So um, for autistic kids, where's the fine line between playing out slash interacting with favorite shows and their own imagination and hallucinations? Also a great question. Um, it depends on also, I think, the ability of the child to describe what they're talking about, um, because if if it's something that um, that is intentional, like I am deciding to, you know, interact with my favorite show or characters, and that's something I'm volitionally engaging in, that would indicate to me that's more of that imaginative play. Um, whereas if it's something that the child does not have control over, um, it just happens and they can't stop it and they find it distressing, I would be a little bit more worried about psychosis. Um, I also think the the, the idiosyncratic nature sometimes of describing experiences in autism um, can can make it a little bit difficult to parse out. Um, 
So for instance, if you just ask the question, like, do you ever hear voices when no one's around? Someone on the spectrum might say yes, if I'm listening to music, right? And so we would want to be, because they're interpreting your question very concretely. And so we would want to think about um, asking follow-up questions and really getting at, well, what do they mean by that when they're describing an experience? If that's helpful. Um, that barcode was linking me to the anger aggression one. It won't let me, it says it's not the right um, registration code. Oh, goodness. And the this 6440 was for the anger one. Well, um, okay, that's the one I received from our, our uh, CME team today. Um, yeah, it's, it says like, you're, thank, uh, sorry, your attendance is outside of meeting times, 122 uh, anger and aggression could not be recorded. Okay. Um, let I'm going to have to get a hold of our CME team and find out more about that. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I don't. Well, I'm, see I'm trying to go through like uh, manually, but it's coming up with like all the other uh, everything for UT Health. Um, yes. With Tyler, so like all the PED stuff and everything. So I was trying to like sure. figure out if I could find a different way around it, but. Uh, I give you credit for trying, Dr. Flynn. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Let me get with the CME team. Uh, for those of you, I have um, uh, in the email box or in the chat, I have put the email address for CPAN. If you are a primary care provider and you're wanting credit for this session, um, first of all, my apologies. Second of all, what I will do is get with the CME team. And if you can contact me by email, I will send you an email back with uh, the corrected information. Okay. What was your email again? I'm going to put it back in here. It's cpaninfo at uthct.edu. And then if you're interested in the handouts from Dr. Ross Young um, or a copy of the slide deck, um, please let me know about that and I'll get that off to you as well. She's got some excellent resources in there. And even as a PDF, you'll be able to access those. We are at the top of the hour. Um, my apologies, um, sincere apologies for the, the QR code gaffe here. I will get a hold of our CME team and see what happened. And again, if you are wanting credit for the session, please do send an email to the CPAN info at uthct.edu email address, and we will get you, I will make sure that that gets sent to you. Thanks so much Thank for joining you, us. Everyone. And then um, our next session is um, on the 25th of March. That one is how internet use and social media affect children's mental health. We have uh, had that one presented in the past as well. Dr. Stephanie Simmons, a colleague of Dr. Ross Young, one of our psychology faculty, and um, she will be presenting that session. It is an excellent session. I uh, hope you can join us. Thanks again for joining us today on this dreary Monday here. At least it's dreary and Tyler. Um, we're glad to have the rain and looking for the sunshine and hope to see you all next month. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Dr. Ross Young, thanks again. Sure appreciate you having this.